everybody. I'm going to make an admission before I make a start. Um, I'm a spin doctor. Hello, this is what we look like. <laughs> I'm a marketeer. I'm an advertiser. I'm a dedicated follower of Mad Men. I work in propaganda and marketing and communications. And I only do it on sustainable development. So I only use my power for good. And there's not very many of us who work on, shall we say, this side of that divide. And there's an awful lot of people who work on the other side. So before we get too deeply into what I want to talk about today, I'm not here to talk to you about climate change. I'm sort of assuming you're university students, you might have heard of it. You know, might have passed right. I haven't been doing my job very well, if you haven't. I'm not going to be talking about parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, whether we can live with 250 or 350. I'm not going to be talking about 2012 and Kyoto. I'm here to talk to you about how you talk to people about this. So that's what I'm going to be discussing. I don't do the product. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does the product. I do the packaging, how you actually talk about this. And I want to just just for a moment, sit with the product for a second so you can understand what it is that my, it's my job to sell. So I stole this exercise from a fantastic guy called Ray Anderson, who's the head of Interface. And could you all please close your eyes for a moment? Whole room, close your eyes. And I want you, whilst your eyes are closed, to imagine a beautiful, safe space. So you're sitting in a lovely space. Take a deep breath in a deep breath out. I want you to imagine what you can see and feel. What can you hear? What's the weather like? What's the temperature like? I want you to imagine what you can smell. Can you hear any sounds? Just sit in this beautiful, lovely, calm, safe space and imagine in detail what the space is like. Now I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to raise your hand if the space that you're in is a natural, an outdoors, an environmental space, if it's a forest or a beach or something. So, keep your hands up and open your eyes and look round. I've got the best product in the world. <laughs> you all want to buy it. I know that that's not the detail of, um, I was imagining a world without climate change and that's what I want to buy. But actually, at heart, we're human beings. It's not that long since we came down out of the trees. Our very deep, visceral, human relationship with natural environments is kind of job number one of what I have to sell. And in fact, when you think about it, we've done a really good job of selling climate change. When you look at the statistics, when you look at the um, Edelman Trust Barometer, when you see that worldwide concern about climate change come number three, in global concerns, where 10 years ago, it wasn't even a factor. When you look at 74% of Americans consider climate change now to be an urgent and pressing issue that requires immediate action. Whereas when I first started going to the US five, six years ago, people would say, climate what? When you look at a piece of research that Futera is currently complete, competing in China, with over a million Chinese, which, by the way, is a statistically relevant sample. I can get away with sampling 3,000 Brits to find out what the average Brits think, and I have to sample a million urban Chinese to find out what the Chinese think. And this is absolute number two concern in China. Whereas five years ago, ten years ago, nobody would have known what I was talking about. In fact, I was introduced recently in the US as an entrepreneur who eight years ago set up a company dedicated to promoting these issues. And it was like, ladies and gentlemen, this is Salatare. Eight years ago, she was a freak. Now she's a freaking genius, which I think kind of sums up where we are. I fell into a niche which actually hadn't existed there. I set my company up when I was 26. Now we have 30 employees in London and New York. And all we do is sell climate change. Just for a moment, though, let's talk about who we're selling it to. Because there's an awful lot of myths about how you get this message across. Um, I sometimes try to explain that selling climate change isn't like trying to sell a new brand of soap into a marketplace. It's like trying to convince people to use soap in the first place. And you have to dig quite deep into the psychology and sociology of change. Because when you think about it, 
This isn't just marketing or PR or spin. This is about getting people to think quite radically about the ways that they live their life. My product isn't something you can go into a store and buy. It's something that you have to do. It's something which you have to change. And a lot of analogies for selling climate change have been used. It's like trying to get people to do rationing during the Second World War. I quite like that one, this kind of vague desire that a lot of Brits have to go back to the good old days of World War. And actually, that's not the case. For most of us who are sitting here, we are not suffering day by day from the impacts of climate change. There's a good argument to be made by the scientists that there are millions of people around the world who already are, but it sure as hell isn't us. So if I try to introduce a Dacronian uh, rationing system where actually each of you had a carbon ration that you were allowed to use every year on what you bought, what you spent, how you travelled, and that if you went over your carbon ration, that that's it. You would either have to buy some more or you'd just not be able to drive anymore. If I was the government that tried to introduce that, I'm pretty sure what would happen, I wouldn't be in government very long. Or perhaps we need a worldwide awakening of values. That globally, we need people to sit there, to stare at their navels and to go, we got it wrong. The way in which we're living our world, our selfish desires and needs are wrong. I'm going to change it. I'm going to become a more giving, a more open. I'm going to be the kind of person who lives a greener, better lifestyle. I think that sounds great. But most of the major religions of the world have been trying to do this for a good couple of thousand years, and they ain't done so well. So in fact, I'm going to take a different path. I'm going to sell a lifestyle. And I'm going to sell a lifestyle to three types of people. And what's really interesting is that we've discovered that these three types of people are pretty consistent around the world. Whether you're talking about African populations, Chinese populations, European populations, generally when it comes to climate change lifestyles, people break down into three with different percentages. And being as I'm your only lady speaker of the day, I'm going to give my three types of people girl names. So, my first person, I'm going to call her Betty. Betty. Betty is what a Freudian psychologist would call an inner directed individual. And Betty's make up about 13 to 15% of the UK population. Betty's, this inner directed. Now, a Betty is an individual who has a very small view of the world, where she works, where she lives, her local community, her local school. She's very well known within that community. She's very active. But outside of that, she doesn't go very far, and nor does she think very far. Now, with Betty, if you're a Betty and I say, stop driving in order to save the world, you're going to look over your shoulder. Because you have no impact on the world, for good or for bad. Stop driving because you uh, might knock over your neighbour's cat. That's within what we would call your sphere of influence, your sphere of concern. But nothing outside of that concern is going to impact you. So bang, already, 13 to 15% of the UK population I lose if I'm talking about saving the world. Now, if I was someone who is into worldwide global values awakening, I might try and change who Betty is. I might try and explain to Betty the fact that she has to have a bigger perspective, the fact that the world is out there, that climate change, that SARS, that global terrorism, that all these big issues, she can have an impact on and impact upon her. But I'm not. I'm a spin doctor. And so I'm going to communicate to Betty in a way that she understands. Although actually, no, I'm not. Because I'm not part of Betty's community. I have the wrong accent. Sometimes I have the wrong colour skin. I have the wrong mannerisms. I don't know who she is. I'm not part of her community. Actually, I can't communicate to Betty at all. Someone within Betty's community is going to have to communicate to her. Start thinking about that on a global scale. Because actually, the Bettys, what we would call the settlers, are a relatively small part of the UK population. They're a much bigger part of even the US population, let alone some other global populations. And in every one of those communities, I'm going to have to find someone who can talk to Betty, because at the moment she's not being reached at all 
by people like me. Bettys do have an advantage, however. Bettys hate change. They hate change. They mistrust it. Change is automatically for the worse. But what that means is it's a massive barrier to overcome, but once I've got that Bettys over that barrier, they are going to be recycling until a second coming. They are literally the most religious about their green behaviours. They continue to do them in the face of great opposition. Once a Betty has begun to take a green or sustainable action, she will continue to take it indefinitely. And some of the messages that work for Betty's are about sustenance, are about being a good homemaker, about being a good provider. Now, if you're like most people, you're sitting there and in your head, you've got a picture of Betty. Yeah, maybe over 45. Might live in a small village somewhere. Quite conservative, probably got a blue rinse. Now, I live in a part of London uh, called Loughborough Junction. It's, bizarre. it's between Camberwell and Brixton. And should we say it's not the safest part of London that you could live in? It's especially not the safest part of London to live in if you're a black man under 20. I'm relatively safe, but if you're a black man under 20, the chances of being involved in violent crime are quite significant. It's also one of the parts of the UK with the highest population of settlers amongst exactly the same community. Very loyal to a small group of people within a community, very distrustful of anybody outside of that community, and completely ignoring anybody like me who comes into that community to discuss things. You can have a 17-year-old lad living on a council estate in Brixton who's a settler. Some of this is uncomfortable to talk about. It's what my job is. I work in PR. Now I'm going to talk about the total opposite end of the spectrum. I'm going to talk about, let's call her Tamsin. And Tamsin is also an inner directed person. She also thinks very much about what she thinks about issues rather than necessarily what other people think about issues. But Tamsin is very into yoga. Tamsin is a global citizen. She thinks about the world. In fact, she has friends and connections all over the world. She's probably a citizen scientist already. She might not know her neighbours. She might not spend very much time in her community at all. Or indeed, consider her community to be geographical at all. She makes up about 25% of the UK population. The golden third, as those of us who work in this market call it, because they're the people who buy our product already. She likes change. She's very ethical. She wants to, work, she wants to live in a different kind of world. She thinks forward. She's quite radical. Her mum thinks she's an indigo child. Some of you know who that, what that means. And Tamsins don't want to be talked to by me either. Because one of the definitions of a Tamsin is that she automatically distrusts marketing, PR, advertising, or anything that feels like the mainstream. She desperately wants to be alternative. And she will change who she is to keep alternative. So the Tamsins, who years ago started recycling, now that most people in the UK recycle, and actually we're, we're reaching about 70%, she doesn't want to do that anymore because actually it's a waste of time, it's an end of pipe problem, most of it's not being recycled at all, so actually what we should be doing is minimising our waste and that we should be burning for fuel any waste that we can't get rid of. Tamsin desperately wanted a Prius. And then when they became quite popular, it's like actually they're not that eco anyway. So I can't talk to Tamsins either, because Tamsins, just like Betty's, trust the people in her community. Her community is generally an online community. She trusts a rather grottily photocopied piece of paper much, much, much more than she would tr trust a beautifully made advert on television. Oh, by the way, I can't reach a lot of Tamsins through television because they don't have them anyway. So they're a whole great big 
parts of the UK population it's really difficult for me to reach. And yet, those are most of the people who I spend my time talking to. So most of the people who would come to hear a speech about climate change or hear a speech about communication generally are Townsends. And then there's the middle, the Heathers. Any of you who have watched the, the movie Heathers already know who I'm talking about. The majority of the UK population are outer-directed, and this is the science bit. An outer-directed person gets their sense of self-worth, one of the most important things that any of us have, a sense of self-worth. She gets her sense of self-worth from what other people think of her, not what she thinks of herself. She lives and dies by what people think of her by her status, by her standing. And another little bit of a history lesson, Heathers have over the years become much, much more involved in consumerism than they were. And there's some reasons for that. So say when you're living in a small community where everyone knows everybody, if you live and die by what other people think of you, then the signals you can send out to get that feedback is about what you do for a living, how good you are in your community, um, how active you are, whether people know who you are. There's a lot of things that you can do. You can build up a relationship over time and get that feedback. Problem is when you move to a city, what you look like, what you drive, how thin you are, how big your boobs are. A lot of people accuse the UK population of being apathetic and being lazy. One third of women in the UK have either had or considered having cosmetic surgery. Think for a moment about how apathetic and lazy getting a boob job is. Minimum two to five thousand pounds. Couple of hours of very painful surgery, by the way, I haven't had it done. Weeks, if not months, of recovery. Expensive, high effort, time consuming, painful. Heathers are not apathetic, lazy people. We're just not motivating them in the right way. And Heathers are who are going to change the world. Tamsins are out there telling us what we need to do to change the world. But it's Heathers where the most ambitious people come from. Just think for a moment about what ambition is. There's some people out there, and I'm sure many of you in this room, who are ambitious through nobility. You're ambitious, you want to reach a powerful, influential position in order to make the world a better place. Most people want to reach a powerful, influential position because they want to be powerful and influential. They are Heathers. If you've got in your head an image of a Heather, of a girl around 30, a little bit too worried about what she's wearing, actually, a lot of chief executives, a lot of prime ministers, a lot of leaders are Heathers. Very very affected by what the world around them thinks. And telling Heathers to do this to change the world, only interested in changing the world if changing the world makes me look good. Doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just the way they're built. So, let's see a show of hands. Can I have hands up those in the room who consider themselves to be a Betty? Anyone who consider themselves to be part of a small community who care very much about what their community thinks, but don't think much about the world. Not very many. Hands up anybody who has a family member who you think is a Betty. Yeah. Yeah, lots of mums, lots of grands, lots of dads. Hands up anyone who thinks they're a Tamsin. Big picture, look at the world. Yeah, lots of Tamsins. Hands up anyone who's got a younger sibling, a friend who they think is a Tamsin. So how many people know Tamsins? Okay. Hands up the Heathers. Yeah. Well done. Look round, because by the way, Heathers really care who other Heathers are. So check out, <laughs> check out the Heathers. All better looking than the rest of you. <laughs> Probably wearing slightly more expensive clothes. So how do you change these people? Number one is to know that not everybody responds the messages of climate change in the same way. The Bettys, the Tamsins, the Heathers all respond in different ways and they hate the messages targeted to each other. So if you're a Tamsin desperate to get people to care about climate change 
and you've already got all of your friends and your other TAMs and your eco geeks into it, then you have to radically change your messages to engage the headers. If you're a Heather, you probably already know what it is like to lead a social pack, so I don't need to tell you what to do. And if you're a Betty, you're probably not here. <laughs> but there's three things that radically affect everybody in different ways, but they radically affect everybody. And the first of them is status. Because remember, the Tamsins have their own type of status anyway. How you dress, what you look, what you eat, where you shop what you do, what you don't do, is an issue for the Tamsins as well. How eco you are, whether you bought any of your clothes new or whether you actually got them all from a second-hand store. That's status for the Tamsins, but it's incredibly influential for the Heathers. Celebrities lend status. A lifestyle that's aspirational lends status. I'll give you an example. Sex lends status. A uh, piece of research was done in university halls of residence in dorms in America. They were co-ed dorms, so both men and women lived there. And these dorms had laundries down in the basement. These laundries were hot, sweaty, unpleasant places where you took your clothes down, you put them in the washer, and there were also dryers. There was also nice places to hang your clothes out of doors, and this was in a nice kind of West Coast university. It was mainly hot, so it was a good idea to hang your clothes to dry out of doors. They found that whilst the women mainly washed their clothes and then hung them out on the line, the men, almost to a man, used the dryers, despite it being disgusting and sweaty in this room and it being expensive and it not being eco. They ran campaign after campaign after campaign to get the men to hang their washing out on the line. Didn't make a blind bit of difference. So they did a whole load of research with the men. Why? Why are you still doing this? It's madness. We've financially incentivized you not to do it. We've run campaigns telling you about the alternative. Why are you still using the dryers? It's no clear answer. So they did a very clever thing, and they asked the women what they thought of the men. And the women thought the men who joined them in hanging the clothes out on the line were probably a bit poorer, than the men who use the dryers, more likely to be gay, and just generally less sexually attractive. Now, a Heather-type man would need to be marched out under gunfire to hang his clothes out on the line. A Betty-type man is probably living at home, and a Tamsin-type man doesn't really care, and he's going to get the girls anyway. He's going to hang it out on the line because it's the right thing to do. Status is incredibly important, and status is in the eye of the beholder. The rest of society sets what's high status, and a lot of work has been done over the last two or three years to make action on climate change, discussion on climate change, high status. Let's talk about number two, social proof. We do what the people around us do. Now, when I do this talk to a room full of men who have got ties on, it's a lot easier. You're all relaxed students on Saturday. Why do men wear ties? It's ridiculous. You get up every morning and you put a very expensive noose around your neck. It lends nothing to the way a man looks. It's inconvenient. It gets in your soup. Um, why do men do it? Men do it because other men do it. Social proof. If you think you are an independent human being taking decisions that you believe are right, then you're wrong. You do what those around you do. You follow the conventions to such an extent that you're not even aware that they're conventions until you visit another country and realize how different the conventions are. We are all the product of social proof. One of the projects that Fitera ran to try and change pro uh, social proof in London was called Lights Out London, where we got Londoners, and a third of Londoners participated to turn their lights out for one hour. In terms of climate change, that means diddly squat. The carbon saved, I'm afraid the hour that the stuff was on before sort of equals it all out. In terms of parts of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, made no difference at all. Wasn't meant to. It was social proof. You get everybody to turn their lights out on the same hour. You get Piccadilly to Circus to turn its lights out for the first time in 60 years. You get the Houses of Parliament to turn their lights out. You get all the big businesses to turn their lights out. You get people to mention it on the television. You get people to turn their lights out, step out of doors and see that everybody else has turned their lights out. Social proof. Everybody's doing it. That means it's okay to do. One of the worst messages we can send out there is 
not enough people recycle. All the public hears is people don't recycle. Be so careful with your messages. Try and generate a sense that everybody is doing this rather than not enough people are doing this. Of course, without lying, I'm a spin doctor after all, not actually a liar. There's a fine line. The third thing, which actually would incredibly motivate almost everybody, every of the three groups, and is almost entirely lacking, is salience. These are three S's of how you bring about change on climate change. Salience means that those things which we can imagine in our head, we believe to be real. Whereas those things which we can't, we don't believe to be real. Which is one of the reasons why more Americans believe in fairies than believe that other parts of the world exist. You can imagine them in their head. It's actually true. Um, we don't have salience at the moment on a low carbon culture. We know what the world is like now, because we live in it. Thanks to people like Al Gore, we know what the world looks like if it's going to screw up really badly. Floods, hurricanes, freezing, melting, it all looks pretty horrible. What we have no idea of is what the world is going to look like if we actually bring about a climate-friendly, low-carbon world. We have the I have a nightmare speech of climate change. We've probably all heard it and read it. But nobody has yet given us the I have a dream speech of climate change. And I can't give it to you either, because I do packaging. I don't do product. And nobody has yet written, produced a comprehensive, all-encompassing vision of what the world would look like, of what our lives would look like if we created a low-carbon culture. So my challenge to you is, if you are a Tamsin, if you're not a Heather, if you know quite a lot about this, start building, perhaps through citizen um, uh, cyber science, a vision of a low-carbon culture. And when you've done that, I'll make it look pretty. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Solitaire Townsend. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions, if anyone has one. Yep. Hi. Um, the grouping of people into those three kind of traits was interesting, but what group do you spin doctors fall under? Pardon? What, what, do do what group do you spin doctors fall under? We are the Heathers. Or if we're not the Heathers, then we, s we spend a lot of time with them. One of the things which I tell the people who work for me to do, because they spend, people come to work, to work for me who've spent a long time reading The Guardian, and I give them either Brides magazine to read for a couple of months, or The Sun, or they have to watch Pop Idol. If you're not part of mass communication, if you're not watching Big Brother, if you're not aware of what's being done in the communication space, you can't hope to change it. So if you're not a Heather, you bloody better learn to think and look at the world like one, because they're the ones who set the zeitgeist to a nation. But then again, won't you be susceptible to the same kind of thought that is a disadvantage of, uh, well, not a disadvantage, but a trait of that group? Not if you, not if you know how the magician hands works. So I, I know very well about status, salience, and social proof. I can sit there, standing in front of a pair of Jimmy Choo's, desperate to buy them, going, bloody status at work. <laughs> And then I'll buy them, and at least I'll know why. <laughs> we have time for one more. Yeah. Hi. Um, I totally agree with you that the message that you've given on climate change is everywhere and, and in all the media now at the moment. But it, it was almost done quite late. Um, did, was there any demand for services like you're providing now before the years that you started at the company? So Futera was started eight years ago in 2001 and we started planning it uh, around the millennium. Um, it was a millennium idea. Um, for the first three years there was three of us, um, not counting the pigeons and the mice in our office. Um, and yeah, it was hard. In terms of demand for our services, not very much. Then the UK government commissioned the first the, globally the first national climate change communications strategy and Futera won that product and that was about five years ago and from then it's been built up. One of the first things that we did 
was we looked at the marketplace and we decided that we were going to work for Shell and Greenpeace. And in fact, there was about two months by turnover, Shell and Greenpeace were my two large, largest clients. Very careful about what I do for both. I think both are contentious and both their messages are contentious. But we will work with anybody who is trying to get a climate change message across. I'm more than happy to spend Shell's money on communicating climate change. Um, but eight years ago, that wasn't the case. We had to create our own marketplace, and it's worked quite well. The big difference has been the shift over the last two years of messages around climate problems to messages around climate solutions. And don't underestimate how fast this is moving. It's not moving anywhere near fast enough, but it's moving exceptionally fast. When you, when you interrogate the language of climate change over the last eight years from what I would call climate pornography, climate porn, you're all going to die, to, through to now actually a different type of climate porn, which is, look at this gorgeous solar panel, isn't it go lovely? You can actually see the movement of language of problems to language of solutions. By the way, just one final anecdote about the Heathers. I have a good friend who's a Heather. She, after years of me banging on at her about climate change, she decided to buy some solar panels. I went round to her house for the big unveiling, glasses of champagne, um, and she unveiled them when we all stood there, and um, very lovely. Her house isn't south-facing, and she'd had the, she'd got the solar panels on the north-facing part of her house, because that's, the, f that's the, pa the part that faces the street. When I pointed out to her that <laughs> it wasn't going to generate that much electricity, she pointed out to me that I'd completely misinterpreted her reason for having a solar panel. So there's a happy, a happy solution to this story which is I convinced her to put the solar panels on the back of her house and to put fake solar panels on the front of her house. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, you can buy fake solar panels. <laughs>